Hi everyone, I'm Katie and welcome to or welcome back to my channel Biology by Katie. In this YouTube video series, I am making my way through the AQA A-level biology specification. Today we're on topic 1.4, which is the or 1.4.4, 1.4.1, which is the general properties of proteins. So we'll be looking at amino acid structure and the specialization of proteins, how they come to be formed. I hope you find this video useful and easy to follow along with. And as always, if you do have any recommendations or requests, please let me know in the comments. In today's topic, we are taking a look at proteins. Proteins are one of the four organic polymers that make up the entire biochemical basis of living organisms. So they are included in that group that is consisting of proteins, lipids, carbohydrates, and nucleic acids. If you remember from the last videos, or if you already know this, um, polymers are made up from monomer units. So the word polymer refers to multiple repeating units and a monomer is a single unit. Now, in terms of proteins, the specific monomer unit of a protein is an amino acid. And we always have a condensation reaction or multiple condensation reactions occurring when we produce polymers from monomers so that's the removal of a water molecule per new bond and the reverse reaction for this is hydrolysis so this is breaking up those bonds using the introduction of a water molecule the first thing that we have to know and have to be familiar with in the A-level syllabus and this topic specifically is the general structure of the amino acids so the general structure of the monomer unit that makes up proteins now, the reason we refer to this as the general structure is that all 20 amino acids that we know of that are coded for by the genetic code have the exact same structure except for one region. So the general structure is made up of atoms of hydrogen, nitrogen, carbon and oxygen. And first of all, at the top, we have this group here called the amine group. So the amine group is the NH2 group, and that contributes to the amino part of the amino acid name. So the amine group is the NH2 at the top there, one nitrogen and two hydrogens. Then at the bottom, we have the carboxyl group. So that is the COOH, the carbon with the double bonded oxygen, which is the carbonyl group. And then you have the OH, which is a hydroxyl group. So put those words together and you have the carboxyl group. Now the next region of the general structure is the R, the labelled R. So this is the variable side chain and we call it that because each of the amino acids that we know of, so all 20, has a different side chain. So they can come in all different um, variations. We can have hydrophobic, hydrophilic, charged side chains, things like that. So the R group is the one part of the amino acid that varies between the different ones. Right, next we're going to look at forming a dipeptide. Now, di is a word that you might be familiar with from looking at other biological molecules, such as disaccharide. Um, so di is the Greek prefix for two. And then that term peptide refers to when we have two or more amino acids. So here we have two separate amino acids there, one at the top and one at the bottom. And they are orientated so that we have the amine group of amino acid two facing the carboxyl group of amino acid one. Now, if you've watched the videos before, or if you're familiar with biological molecules and how polymers are formed, you will know that it is a condensation reaction that is responsible for forming new bonds between two or more monomer units. So in this case, we have two monomer units and we're about to form a new bond. So this will, of course, be a condensation reaction where a molecule of water is removed. So there we can see that one hydrogen atom is removed from the amine group of amino acid 2, and we have the hydroxyl group being removed from the carboxyl region of amino acid 1. So in total, we've removed two hydrogens and one oxygen, which constitute to a whole water molecule. Around the region where the water molecule was removed from, we will, of course, be having a new bond being formed. Now, in case of a protein, that specific bond is called a peptide bond. So when we think about the fact that here we've got two amino acids joined together by a peptide bond, we call this structure a dipeptide, meaning two amino acids chemically joined together by this new bond. So the new peptide bond will form between the second carbon in the amino acid one and the nitrogen from the amine group of amino acid 2.
Now we're going to move on to the formation of polypeptides. Now again, that term poly should be familiar to us by now, having gone through the biological molecules topic. So poly means many or multiple, the Greek term for many or multiple, and peptides is that term that is specific to the formation of proteins here. So what this term refers to is simply the joining of more than two, because in the case of two, we have a dipeptide. So three or more amino acids joined together by peptide bonds, and you will have a polypeptide chain. So here we have four amino acids joined together, three peptide bonds formed, and we will, of course, have three molecules of water being removed due to three condensation reactions having taken place. The unique sequence of amino acids, so how they join together, which ones appear in which order in the polypeptide chain, is determined by the genetic code. So the DNA is read and the amino acid sequence is assembled accordingly. This sequence, this unique sequence of amino acids that we end up with, in turn forms the what we call the primary structure of a protein. So this is the simplest level of protein structure consisting of the specific order of amino acids. So the primary protein structure for proteins will be different each time. So one protein might have a certain order of amino acids while a different protein has a different order of amino acids. And again, this is all coded for by the unique genetic code. Once the polypeptide chain and therefore the primary protein structure has been finalized, the proteins will move on to form a secondary structure. The reason for this is once the amino acids have taken part in peptide bonding, their structure is slightly altered due to the loss of either a hydrogen atom or a hydroxyl group. So when we look at the amino acid one in the example that we went through just before, the oxygen atom at the carb where the carboxyl group was is has a an overall negative charge so it doesn't become an ionized it's not an ion but it has an overall negative charge so we call this a negatively charged region and on the other hand with the amine group or what was the amine group of amino acid 2 we have an overall positive charge at the hydrogen atom there so we have a positively charged region so we use this symbol here to represent partial charge. So in this case, it's not an ionized molecule, but it has a partial charge. So we have that partial negative charge around the oxygen atom, and we have the partial positive charge at the hydrogen atom. And as a consequence, we have this weak electrostatic force of attraction forming between the oppositely charged regions. And we call this type of electrostatic attraction a hydrogen bond or hydrogen bonding. So in a long sequence polypeptide chain, the positively charged hydrogen atom interacts with the negatively charged oxygen atom in this way. Now the result of these electrostatic interactions is the secondary structure of proteins being formed. And we do have two configurations of this secondary structure that we need to be aware of. The first one is this structure here, which is the alpha helix, which is the more common of the two. The alpha helix is formed as a result of hydrogen bonds occurring between the NH group or the positively charged hydrogen interacting or forming electrostatic forces with the negatively charged oxygen atom four residues away, so four amino acids prior. As a result of this, the polypeptide chain is pulled into this unique helical structure that has a turn once every just under four amino acids. The next secondary structure configuration is the beta pleated sheet. So the beta pleated sheet is quite different to the alpha helix in the sense that this occurs when the polypeptide chain turns quite sharply and forms these parallel beta strands. Now, hydrogen bonding then takes place between the parallel strands to form this sheet like structure. Because the hydrogen bonding is occurring between parallel strands, this beta pleated sheet configuration cannot exist as a single strand structure. Once our polypeptide chain has folded into either an alpha helix or a beta pleated sheet, it can then move on to form the next stage, which is the tertiary structure. The tertiary structure refers to the overall 3D structure that a protein is going to adopt. 
So the tertiary structure represents the overall twisting and folding of the polypeptide chains into their final shape. And it gives way for two major 3D configurations, which are globular and fibrous. As this is quite a complex stage in the overall production of proteins, it involves a number of different bonding types. So we've already been introduced to hydrogen bonding, which occurred to pull together the secondary structure in either the alpha helix or the beta pleated sheet. So the hydrogen bonding occurred between positive and negatively charged regions of the amino acid. So we will, of course, have a lot of hydrogen bonding at play here. Another type of bonding that we have is disulfide bridges. Now, this is a form of covalent bonding, so where we have electron sharing occurring between atoms. The reason why we call it disulfide is because this interaction happens specifically between two sulfur atoms at the end of two cysteine amino acids. So this type of bonding only occurs between two cysteine amino acids specifically. So what happens is the two sulfur atoms will share electrons in attempt to become more stable and therefore we will have a covalent bond formed which we refer to as a disulfide bridge. Next up we have the presence of ionic bonding. Some of the amino acid chains can form positive or negatively charged ions, so they can become ionized, so they either lose or gain an electron. In this case, we have ions that will then interact with each other and form a different type of electrostatic attraction called ionic bonds. Next up, we have an interesting type of interaction that contributes to the overall 3D structure of a protein called hydrophobic interactions. You might remember from when we looked at lipids or something that you already know is that the hydrocarbon chains when we look at fatty acids are hydrophobic and that is what causes them to form the phospholipid bilayer, the unique structure of the cell membrane. Similar sort of thing going on here. So we have hydrophobic hydrocarbon chains that don't want to interact with the water around them. So they face each other and interact with each other in order to sort of expel water molecules. Finally, now we're going to move on to look at the quaternary structure of proteins. So not all proteins do have a quaternary structure. Some of them stop at tertiary because the quaternary structure actually refers to the interaction of multiple polypeptide chains. So two or more polypeptide chains tightly arranged together. Now, a really good example of a well-known protein that does have a quaternary structure is hemoglobin, so the oxygen carrying molecule inside red blood cells. So hemoglobin proteins are made up of four polypeptide chains. We have two alpha chains and two beta chains. And each of those polypeptide chains is also associated with a non-protein element called a heme group, which has a ferrous ion responsible for loading oxygen. Let's do a recap on how we've come to form our final complex protein structure. So first of all, we have the formation of the polypeptide chain. So we have multiple amino acid molecules joining together via a series of condensation reactions, forming a number of peptide bonds along the way. The polypeptide chain, so that specific sequence of amino acid that is determined by the genetic code, is then referred to as the primary protein structure. Then we go on to classify the protein even further by forming the secondary structure. So the secondary structure is controlled by hydrogen bonding that occurs between positively and negatively charged regions of the amino acids. We have two major configurations, the alpha helix or the beta pleated sheet. Next, we go on to form the final overall 3D structure that is held together by a number of different bonds. So we have covalent disulfide bridges, ionic bonding, hydrophobic interactions, and of course, hydrogen bonds. And then finally, we have the quaternary structure, which is the highest classification of protein folding. So this refers to in cases where we have multiple polypeptide chains joined together to form one overall protein. And a really common example of this is hemoglobin. So our overall protein is formed in four steps. We have the primary structure, the secondary structure, the tertiary structure, and then finally the quaternary structure. And in the end, we have our completed protein that is ready to go ahead and form a number of different specialized roles within the cell.